the record button. All right, we've now Thank started you. recording. So um, we're really fortunate to have the chance tonight to host uh, an information talk with Dr. Maria Huang. And uh, Dr. Huang's a board certified pediatrician practicing in Olympia and Centralia, if I understand correctly, active member of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And so I've had the chance to hear really great things about you, Dr. Huang, from colleagues who have uh, had you speak or heard you speak on topics related to COVID. And so uh, thank you for joining us. And I wanna actually begin by thanking you for joining us. And also wanna thank uh, Tumwater School District Board Member Darby Kaikinen, who made the connection with us uh, to make this opportunity possible. So, uh, so if you're watching, we're in a webinar format with the chat feature enabled. And so uh, Dr. Huang, I think you have some information you'll share probably to start, but to hear off. And then uh, if people have questions, you can put uh, questions while we're going into the, there's a Q&A feature there and you can add questions into that Q&A feature. And that's something that as we get to breaks, we could follow up with answers. And then certainly if we get to a question answer session, people, there's a, there's a raise your hand button at the bottom of the screen. If you use that raise your hand button, then we can, if you want to ask a question verbally, we can open that up for, uh, for that. So we'll figure a way to make this smooth and, and an easy way to communicate. And uh, with that, I'll turn, that, turn this over to you to share uh, information about the uh, vaccine. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being open to hearing me talk. Um, I do, so I have about a 20 minute PowerPoint that I'll go through and then happy to answer questions after that. Um, can I share, can you allow me to share my screen? Should have, I, I thought I had it set so you could. So let's see here, uh, all says all panelists can share. So let's see, are, are you not getting the option on your screen to share? Um, let's try it. No. Hmm. Let's see. Since oh, wait, here we go. Okay, I think I got it. Perfect. Go. Perfect. I am not the most tech savvy, so thank you for your patience. Okay, I think we are good. All right. Well, as um, Superintendent Dotson said, my name is Maria Huang. I am a pediatrician um, and I live in Tumwater and I've been practicing since 2011. I currently work at Northwest Pediatrics and we have um, offices in Lewis and Thurston County. So um, we serve the kind of Lewis and Thurston County areas. So I'm gonna give a talk today about the COVID vaccine. And um, before we start, just a few disclosures. So as I'm sure you know, COVID information and research and science is constantly evolving and changing. So thank you for your flexibility and your patience on this. Um, and the information I'm gonna to present today is not, um, I'm not taking sides. It's not at all meant to be political. Um, but just basing all my presentation on um, science and research. So I always like to just kind of overview the numbers so far. So as of yesterday, we still um, are seeing a huge impact of COVID, obviously in the county, in our nation, in our world. So there have been 3.6 million deaths so far um, in the US, close to 600,000 and in Washington, 5,801 deaths. Here in Thurston County, we've seen 10,000 um, plus cases of COVID with 106 deaths. So in terms of the avail available COVID uh, vaccines, there are two mRNA vaccines. So Pfizer, which is two doses, 21 days apart, and Moderna, which is two doses and 28 days apart. Now these, both these vaccines are ex extremely effective. So 95% effective in reducing symptomatic illness. And um, if you get the vaccine, your risk of severe illness, which means hospitalization or death from COVID is, is close to zero, which is pretty amazing. Um, and as a pediatrician, I wholeheartedly agree with this quote by the WHO director that immunization is one of the most powerful and fundamental disease prevention tools in the history of public health. 
So I know the term operation warp speed probably didn't instill a lot of confidence in many people, um, but actually mRNA vaccines have been studied for about a decade. Um, so we've looked at these vac these, this technology for influenza, Zika, and rabies uh, viruses. And the only really new part of it is that the discovery that we can put the mRNA in a lipid particle to prevent degradation. So mRNA has pros and cons. It is actually very unstable. So when you're working with it in a lab, it's really difficult because it's so unstable. But the good side of it is that once it's introduced into our cells, it does what it needs to do and then it degrades. So because it's so unstable and with that lipid particle is the reason why we have to store these vaccines at those extremely cold temperatures. Um, but mRNA vaccines are actually faster to produce in larger amounts than traditional vaccines, which is a plus, um, and which is why I think we've been seeing it come out so quickly. So in terms of vaccine trials, again, I think it, it seems like this whole process was rushed, but the COVID vaccine trials, COVID vaccine went through all the same vaccine trials as any other vaccine that we've made um, in the history, uh, in US history. So this slide is a little bit busy, so I won't go through all of it, but I'll just highlight that um, Phase three is when we test the vaccine on large numbers of people in our, in our community. And so Pfizer had 45,000 participants, Moderna had 30,000, and Johnson & Johnson had 43,000 participants. So um, this was all done prior to it being administered to the public. Um, and I think, again, in, in order to uh, answer that question about it being rushed. So we are in the middle of a pandemic and a lot of government money went to companies to research this vaccine. So in normal times, that is not the case. And so vaccines can take a long time to develop. But again, because we're in a pandemic, we had the benefit of kind of getting through that red tape and getting a lot of funding. In addition, for most vaccine trials, there's a lag between phases two and three when com pharmaceutical companies are really uh, recruiting a lot of patients or, or um, volunteers to be part of their study. And so it takes time. But again, because we're in a pandemic, there were actually thousands of volunteers who were willing to participate um, in these trials. So that was able to be pushed through a lot quickly, a lot more quickly. But again, the COVID vaccine went through all the same trials as any other vaccine. And then phase four is ongoing surveillance. So now that the vaccine is available to the public, we are still monitoring for long-term side effects. And I know that is a big question what are the long-term side effects? So we haven't had this vaccine out for very long. It's been out for about a year. Um, but the good news is that with all previous vaccines, those long-term effects really were seen in the first six to 12 months after administering the vaccine. And so because we haven't seen any really untoward serious side effects. This is good news with the hope that um, we probably won't. Not for sure, but if kind of history repeats itself, it, it is a positive note. So the other vaccine available is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And this is um, different from mRNA. It uses a viral vector and it's a single dose vaccine. Um, and the virus that they use is the adenovirus 26, which is not a live virus and it can't cause disease, um, but it is the way, as opposed to the mRNA, it introduces the genetic information so we can produce antibodies. And this vaccine is also very effective, 75% um, in reducing symptomatic illness, and again, close to 100% in preventing 
severe illness, hospitalization, and death from COVID. So I think many of you heard of the, the pause in administrating the J&J vaccine back in April. Um, and this was based on six women and in between the ages of 18 and 48 who developed um, a rare clot in addition to a low platelet count. And this happened between one and two weeks after getting the vaccine. So in April, the CDC and the FDA put a pause on J&J &J vaccine. And um, after 11 days on April 23rd, it, they decided it was safe to um, again administer J&J &J vaccine with the caveat that women under the age of 50 should be aware of this risk of clot and they may opt to do the mRNA vaccine, which does not, as we know of, have that risk. Um, but again, it's important to remember the numbers here. So that was six cases among 6.8 million vaccine doses. Um, so that risk was still very small, less than one in a million. This slide is also a little bit busy, but it, it's um, nice because it shows how on the left, the um, virus vector works, the J&J vaccine, and on the right, the mRNA vaccine. And essentially what is happening is that this genetic information is introduced into our cells and we're able to make antibodies um, when our body sees the COVID virus to protect us. So side effects are very common after any vaccine and COVID vaccine does not differ. Um, so there are local side effects, pain, swelling, redness around, um, around the injection site. And it's often referred to as COVID arm. And it's pretty common that you will get one of these symptoms. Um, but the good news is that it resolves within two, three days and then um, most people are fine. Systemically, there are people who um, have fever, chills, kind of nausea, GI symptoms, muscle aches, fatigue, headache, and those aren't uncommon. Um, 50 to 80% of people will have at least one of those symptoms. But again, the good news is that that usually resolves pretty quickly. So the, the main um, point in this talk is really uh, I'm trying to debunk a lot of the myths that are out there. So um, none of these vaccines affect our DNA. Um, you can't get COVID from the vaccine. There's no live virus in there. As I mentioned previously, side effects are common, but that doesn't mean that you have COVID. Um, I know there are TikTok videos and YouTube videos out there about microchips and um, people putting magnets on their arms where they got the injection and proving that there's microchips in the vaccine. But actually, even the tiniest microchip um, known to mankind is still way too big to inject via vaccine into humans. Um, another big concern, I think, for women is uh, concern about effects on fertility and pregnancy, and there has been no scientific evidence that it affects those things. Um, there was a, a vaccine trial on 60,000 women, 30,000 received the Pfizer vaccine, 30,000 received the Moderna vaccine, and many of these women became pregnant or were pregnant when they got the, the vaccine. And there were no um, untoward effects when compared to control group uh, women who did not get the vaccine. And we now know too that vaccine during pregnancy can actually uh, give antibodies to the, to the baby, which is another benefit. Another concern, which I know is, is often a sensitive topic um, with religion and um, is the concern about fetal tissue in, in the vaccine. So it's really important to differentiate fetal tissue from fetal cells. 
So there is not any fetal tissue in any of these vaccines. But Johnson & Johnson did use fetal cell lines to um, make their vaccine. And this, these cell lines were taken from a 1985 elective abortion in Denmark. But fetal cells, again, are different from fetal tissue in that fetal cell lines are uh, propagated in a lab. And so the cell lines used for the J&J &J vaccine actually are thousands of generations removed from this original elective abortion. Um, and it's, it's important to note that, you know, these abortions weren't being done to, to make vaccines. These were happening anyway. And if you can look at it with a silver lining um, from an unfortunate event is that we were able to produce vaccines which have saved millions of lives. And this slide is just to reiterate that misinformation is out there and we actually know that misinformation gets tweeted and shared on social media four times more often than actual facts. So in terms of vaccine doses, um, there have been 296 million uh, doses given in the US and so about 42% of our population is fully vaccinated. Um, in the first week when uh, ages 12 to 15 were authorized to get the Pfizer vaccine, there were 600,000 children who were vaccinated. Um, and then in Washington, there have been 7.6 million doses of the vaccine given. And our vaccination rate is on par with the US with about 42% of our population being vaccinated. And I'm sure you've heard of herd immunity. So we really would like to get those rates closer to 70 to 80% to really protect the community as a whole. So there are still quite a few unknowns out there. Um, so we don't know how long the vaccine provides protection, although newer evidence says that it's at least six months and probably I, more definitely a year and probably longer, um, but we're still following that. Uh, we're still not absolutely sure if you're vaccinated, if you can still spread the virus asymptomatically, but the current evidence says that this is probably unlikely. And we still know that a lot of people are not vaccinated or don't have access to the vaccine. And so we do want to continue preventive measures. Um, and I can go into that in the, uh, more detail in the next slide. So if you get vaccinated um, and you are fully vaccinated, which means two weeks after your single dose of J&J, &J, or two weeks after your second dose of Pfizer or Moderna. There are quite a few perks. Um, in addition to the Krispy Kreme donut and the beer, um, the 21 and over, of course. Um, so vaccinated people, according to the CDC guidance, do not need to quarantine if they are exposed to someone um, with known COVID as long as they stay asymptomatic. So if they develop symptoms, it's still encouraged to go and be tested. Um, but quarantine is not necessary if you remain asymptomatic. And this doesn't apply though in high risk settings like group homes or jails um, or juvenile detention facilities. In addition, uh, CDC came out recently with uh, less restrictions on vaccinated people so they can gather indoors and outdoors without masking, without distancing. Previously, it was a little bit more restricted. And now um, we know that vaccines are, are very effective. And so um, you're able to do a bit more. So, um, kind of the hot topic is, is vaccine, COVID vaccine in children. And so there's emergency youth use authorization for Pfizer vaccine in ages 12 and up. And Moderna and J&J &J are approved for 18 and up, although 
advisor and mentor and I both have trials going on with kids as young as six months. Um, and the Journa is likely to be authorized for 12 and up in the next week or two. And there is a possibility that elementary aged kids will be um, approved for the vaccine, I'm hoping by the fall. So there have been cases, um, a few cases of myocarditis and pericarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle and inflammation of the lining around the heart um, in mostly adult, uh, young adult and adolescent males after, um, within a few days after the second dose of the mRNA vaccine. So this is still being looked into, um, but we as physicians and pediatricians are recommended to uh, be on the lookout if there's um, an adolescent or a young adult who comes in with chest pain, shortness of breath, or heart palpitations, and they've recently received the COVID mRNA vaccine. But at this point, there are a, just a few cases, and CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics is still recommending COVID vaccine for everyone 12 and up. And also important to just remember that uh, COVID, the virus actually is very likely to produce um, heart issues. And so the risk of the vaccine is much lower than actually getting COVID illness. So I'm just going to touch on this briefly. So there are uh, COVID variants that we're watching out for. The, they've recently renamed these variants. So um, now they're called Alpha, Beta, and Gamma, uh, and Delta. But the one that we know of that um, was first seen in the UK, um, in the United Kingdom, B117, is currently the dominant strain in the US. And these two, B1427 and B1429 out of California, those, uh, the UK virus alpha and these California variants are the predominant strains right now in Washington. The beta uh, variant out of South Africa is notable because our vaccines seem to be a little bit less effective uh, with this variant, but still provides quite good protection um, against severe illness. And then gamma and delta, the variants out of Brazil and India are, we're watching closely, but aren't circulating widely um, in Washington or the US just yet. So in terms of take home points, we do still need to continue preventive measures. So hand hygiene, staying home when you're sick, distancing, masking, especially in school settings um, and medical facilities. Uh, getting vaccinated is really the best way to protect yourself and the greater community. Um, and I believe is really our only hope at kind of moving towards a new normal. And then I'll just reiterate that any risk of the vaccine um, exponentially outweighs the, the risks of actual disease. And we've been seeing, you know, a lot of people say, well, kids aren't affected very much, but kids can still get COVID. Um, and we see MISC, multi-inflammatory disease in children, and kids do die of COVID. So um, on the top 10 list of causes of death in children, COVID is about number six or seven. And so it, it is still a real, a real concern. Um, and then really, I will end on that, the fact that I think this is a choice not of vaccine versus no vaccine, but really vaccine versus getting the COVID virus. So. I, um, again, really appreciate you allowing me to speak today and am happy to answer any questions. So we have a couple of questions that have been put into the chat and I, I, we can start from there. And certainly then uh, 
if um, if anyone wants to uh, speak up, then we can add additional questions or continue to add them into the Q and A. So the first question that was asked by one of our participants is, how would you suggest convincing a loved one in the Midwest that there are no microchips in the vaccine, essentially, besides the microchip size factor? Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I, I feel like the, the size is a compelling reason. Um, the, other, the other issue, too, I, I feel like if people are worried about um, microchips in the sense that they can track our information or or follow what we're doing i think cell phones <laughs> obviously um can do all that already so yeah i i guess i don't have a great way of addressing that except for the fact that again there's it's it's impossible to introduce a micro trip microchip uh, via injection. And, um, you know, there's been 296 doses of vaccine being given so far. And I don't think anyone is is saying that they all all of them have microchips. So <laughs> another question in the chat is, uh, and I'm seeing a few, thank you for adding your questions. And so what how great are the risk of side effects for someone with a weakened immune system? So that's a great question. Um, again, I'll I'll reiterate the fact that someone with a weakened immune system, if they get COVID illness, are really at high risk of, of severe illness. And so getting the vaccine would be really important for them. Um, that being said, we know that some people who have a weakened immune system may actually not produce a very um, robust antibody response to the vaccine. Um, we know with other vaccines, some people just don't get that antibody response. But I would say, again, the, the risks and side effects of the vaccine are so much lower than actually getting the disease that I would still highly, highly encourage people with uh, weakened immune systems who are, again, at, at huge risk for severe COVID illness to consider get, getting the vaccine. Okay, so a uh, um, uh, question asked below, uh, would you vaccinate your own children? Yeah, um, no question. So I am vaccinated. My husband who's also in the medical field is vaccinated. My daughter who's eight isn't currently um, authorized to get the vaccine, but I would not hesitate uh, as soon as it's available, I will get her vaccinated as well. And, you know, as pediatricians, we've dealt with a lot of vaccine concerns and hesitancy. And I think one of the most compelling arguments that I can give is that I vaccinate my own child for, for all vaccines, so including flu vaccine. So if a child has COVID, how long should you wait to vaccinate? Good question. So right now we're saying if they have had a severe, um, severe case of COVID, something like MISC, multi-inflammatory, um, disease in children, the recommendation is to wait 90 days before vaccination. Uh, we still encourage people, even if they've had COVID, to get the vaccine. Get the vaccine. Um, we don't know how long protection is after you've gotten the actual illness. Um, and so we do know that the COVID vaccine protects against a lot of different variants. And um, what we've seen actually anecdotally is that people who have had kind of long haul symptoms with COVID, those people who've just, you know, have gotten over their COVID illness, but continue to have fatigue and um, other issues. What we've seen anecdotally is that after one dose of the COVID vaccine, in some cases, those long haul symptoms have um, disappeared, which is 
amazing. And they seem to have a much more robust antibody response to the vaccine as well. Um, and we know with natural immunity, some, in some cases, people who have gotten COVID have had mild illness. And so we don't know that that antibody response would be as robust as the vaccine or as robust as someone who's had severe COVID illness. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, seeing in the, I'm, I'm moving over to the chat box now, uh, making sure I've got those. So um, what's the recommendation if you have the symptoms of myocarditis or uh, pericarditis? What are, I'm sorry, what are those symptoms? That's kind of saying po uh, post-vaccine. Any recommendation if you have the symptoms of, I, I might, I'm, if I'm mispronouncing it, myocarditis and pericarditis? Yeah, no, you got it right. Okay. Um, so definitely we are in are as you know, physicians and pediatricians um, watching out for any complaints or of symptoms of chest pain, palpitations, um, those types of concerns after getting the vaccine. Um, but then I'll also note that the recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics is that any um, teen 12 and up who has had COVID does need to be evaluated by um, a physician or a pediatrician, especially if they have moderate to severe disease before going back to sports and, and having actually an EKG um, and a, a good cardiac eval. But in terms of the myocarditis and pericarditis, those can be serious, but most often when you get that, it's, it's pretty mild illness. But um, yeah, we are, you know, being very um, open and honest about what we've been seeing. And we have seen some cases of that. And so want the public to know and want them to be informed. But again, that risk is, you know, far lower than actually getting COVID illness. So another question, um, if, we, if we don't know how long this lasts, may it end up being like the flu shot where we would need to get it yearly? Yeah, we're still looking into that. Um, as I said, we think and, and know that it probably lasts um, more than a year, um, but there is possibility that we will need boosters, especially with new variants that come out um, that will need kind of updates on that vaccine to protect against the newer newer um, variants. But right now, there is no recommendation for boosters at this point. But as I said, um, you know, our information and research is, is constantly changing. So that may change in the next day or month or week. <laughs> Let's see, that's all the questions I have in the chat box at this time. So if there's other questions that people have, please feel free to add them either into the Q&A, into the chat box, or if you, or, or raise your hand and I can, oh, there we go. I see someone has hand up. Let me see if, uh, Jane, uh, I think it's, let me make sure I've got the right. Okay, James, I'm gonna open you up so you can talk. James, do you have a question? Um, oh, it looks like, so you're muted right now and what it's looking like the way it's, uh, it's indicating. All right. I, I think I'm unmuted. There you are. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, thank you. And Dr. Huang, I was a little bit late. You pronounce your name Huang. Is it, is it Huang? It's Huang. Huang. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I apologize. Okay. All right. So Dr. Wong, you said a lot um, and I really appreciate your courage. Now you, you obviously know that there are a lot of, um, a lot, there's a lot of pushback from a lot of doctors. Um, some are being, uh, I guess, I don't want to use the word censored. I want to sound like that guy. But the fact is, there are very some very concerning points. Um, what do you say? Well, you, you say, let me just touch on the, um, the immunity for the children. Um, 
How many children have died of COVID-19? Do you know that number? Yeah, I, as of last week when I looked, it's somewhere between around 350 children in the U.S. 350 children in the U.S. And then that, that they, when we say die of COVID, I know the definition of dying of COVID means not necessarily dying of COVID, but dying with COVID. So I'm, I'm sort of trying to pinpoint the actual COVID virus as the cause of death. I don't think we have those numbers, but what I'm more concerned about is um, you mentioned the robust immune response in, in a child whose immune system is very strong, so they would have more of a they would have more of a robust immune response. Can't that, in and of itself, be dangerous? Um, are, do you mean a robust immune response to the vaccine? Yes, to, to the, the vaccine. Virus? I'm sorry. Yes, to the vaccine. To the vaccine. So no, it, that what that means is, and actually, we know that younger people who get the vaccine, um, like in their 30s and 40s have a more robust immune response than folks who are in their 70s and 80s. Um, and so it it's not dangerous to have that. It just, it means that you, you're able to mount um, protection if you see, if your body sees the virus. With the reason we're, we're looking, um, and it's taking a little bit longer to authorize the use in younger kids is because we're actually looking at the dosing and younger children may not need the full dose that we're giving to those 12 and up to produce the same sort of um, antibody immune response. So is that- It's not is, dangerous. Well, I mean, it's, and, I, and I hear what you're saying, doctor, but, I, but what my concern is that that's where we're seeing our inflammation, isn't it? Because the immune response, the robust immune responses is, the inflammation, is that not the case? True, um, well, that's that's the side effects we see. So with any vaccine, you will have some side effects. Um, but I guess my point is that if you get the actual virus, that inflammation is pretty uncontrolled. We don't know how your body is gonna respond to that as opposed to the vaccine, where we know if you see the virus, your risk of severe illness from COVID is extremely low. Well, we, we do know that the coronavirus, the, the mortality rate among children, so we're talking about children here because uh -huh. I have a child in the school district, so I, I like to just be parochial here. So we're talking about children who perhaps catch the coronavirus naturally with the mortality rate of, of less than, well, statistically zero, isn't it? And a recovery it's, rate of 99.9974. Is that what I'm reading? Um, it's, it's definitely low, um, but at the same time, it's important to remember that children shouldn't be dying, <laughs> right? Um, we never want children to die. And the fact that it is on the top 10 list of causes of death in children is concerning, but you're right. I mean, most often kids do fine, but the reason again, that we need to vaccinate them is because we don't know how, how long that immunity lasts. And the concern is that these kids can still bring the virus home to the elderly or the immunocompromised people who are really at high risk. Right, right. Okay. And I, you know, and I'll let you off the hook in a minute, Dr. Wong. <laughs> I just, well, you said so many things, but we, we, but, you know, unfortunately people die all the time. I mean, there's more people dying from the, the influenza virus um, than, than we care to share either, but people that's, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. People die, children die. So let me just ask you. So um, a child is vaccinated, um, which minimizes the symptoms of coronavirus. However, we know that it does not stop transmission and it does not stop them from contracting the virus. 
wouldn't that make them asymptomatic carriers and they, they can actually infect um, more vulnerable people and not know it? Right, so that that is true. We don't know if vaccinated people can still transmit the virus asymptomatically, but the evidence thus far shows that that is pretty unlikely. So the reason we are still being really um, protective and still, you know, talking about masking and distancing is because we don't know that, but we are following um, uh, cases to see if that's true or not. And so far, the likelihood of asymptomatic transmission in someone who is fully vaccinated is low. It's not zero, but it's mm -hmm. low. So we're basically just this is like a pay as you go type of thing because we really don't know, do we, doctor? I mean, this we haven't done this long enough to really know anything. I mean, it's it's um, it hasn't had any longitude, any significant longitudinal studies. So we really don't know. I mean, and that's fair to say, isn't it? You mean about the vaccine? Just about the long term effects of the vaccine, whether there's going to be prion like diseases. I mean, I'm hearing a lot about this and I'm reading it much more about this spike protein. And that's really the main concern that I have. Like, we don't know where this spike protein goes. We don't know what it's gonna do when it gets there. We don't know how long it's gonna be, wherever it goes. We know that it's gonna cross the blood brain barrier. We know that there's been um, severe side effects. The, the, vaccine adverse repent, uh, the vaccine adverse event reporting system has very staggering statistics, very concerning. And that, that's where, where I am. I, I'm looking at the spike protein and, and, and um, the impact it's having on um, uh, people's, people's psychosis and just the immunological or uh, um, um, immune uh, disorders that, that are surfacing now um, as a result of, of this spike protein crossing the blood-brain barrier. So that, that's my main concern. What can you speak to about the VAERS reporting system that's showing over 4,000 deaths um, after vaccination, over 262,000 severe uh, side effects after vaccination. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, well, I think um, a few things. Um, you're right, we don't know the long-term effects. Um, you know, this vaccine has been out for a year, and so that's the data we have. Um, but as I mentioned, um, in one of my slides, the, the long-term effects we've seen from other vaccines have really shown up within the first six to 12 months of um, having the vaccine be widely uh, in, the, in the public. So, so far- But this is, this, is a first, this is a first though for the mRNA type of vaccine, correct? So we, we really don't know um, with, with this type of vaccine, correct? Well, we've been studying mRNA vaccines for over 10 years, um, so that is not new. The technology to introduce the mRNA into our cells is new with the lipid particle um, right. because the mRNA is so unstable, but we know that mRNA degrades quickly after it's introduced, so the concerns about affecting DNA and long-term effects are really quite minimal. Um, so that, that hydrogel, I'm sorry, that, that hydrogel um, that you're talking about, that lipid particle, um, that's, that's sort of like designed to fool our cells to, to incorporate this vaccine, correct? Because if, if yeah. our, our, our bodies would, would fight this vaccine off had it not been for the hydrogel to sort of sneak it in there. Well, mostly it's to prevent degradation of the mRNA. So it needs, the mRNA needs a stable vector to get introduced into our cells. And because mRNA is so unstable, that lipid particle helps introduce it. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Wong. I appreciate it. You, you've, you've answered a lot of my questions. I didn't, I didn't mean it to, to, to be uh, interrogational, but I, <laughs> this is a very serious, I mean, we are in a, in a very serious place as a country and, and medically, and, I, and I'm just, um, 
you know, I, I just have questions. I just have concerns. So, so thank you um, for your input and thank you for your, for your courage. Yeah, no, thank you. And I'll just add, you know, you mentioned about the VAERS um, vaccine reporting. And I would argue that all those concerns, I mean, look at the millions of deaths that COVID has caused, you know, and now we have a vaccine that can really prevent severe disease and hospitalization and death. And we have countries around the world who are, who are begging for this vaccine. Um, and we're fortunate enough in this country to have it available. So as someone, you know, who's in the medical profession and a husband who also is, who see people die of COVID, um, it just, it's really compelling for me to want to share the information about the vaccine and how it can really save lives. But I appreciate you. your I pre questions. I no, I appreciate you. that. No, last one, I'll leave you with this one. So we haven't spoken about any treatments for, for um, this virus, this coronavirus. Uh, we've spoken a lot about vaccines, um, but I don't hear anyone talking about treatments. What, what are some of the treatment options for, for someone with COVID? Yeah, I, I'm gonna admit right now that I'm not an expert on that. I know that, um, you know, I don't treat adults. And so adults are the ones who are dying most frequently of COVID. There is a lot of research out there being done um, to treat COVID. And I think there is a, a medication that is being looked at um, to be authorized to treat COVID. But you're right, we don't, we don't have things just yet. I mean, we use right. things like remdesivir and dexamethasone to treat, but Right now, there is no cure. Because ivermectin and hydrochloroquine, those seem to be effective. Yeah, I think the jury's out on that. Um, I don't know that those are being used um, across the board as, right. as de dexamethasone definitely is something that um, people who have severe COVID illness and respiratory uh, issues, everyone gets dexamethasone. Not everyone right. gets ivermectin or things like that. Okay. But again, I'm I'm happy to admit that I'm not an expert on right. treatment of COVID. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Do we any other uh, questions? Either in the chat. Okay. Oh, let's see. Here's a. Uh, Here's a, I have one here that says, uh, someone had uh, said, uh, I have, I've known far more people, I don't know if it's a question, but a statement maybe that I've known far more people that have gotten really sick from the vaccine than just getting COVID. And so I think it's that question about is, uh, is the, is, does the vaccine cause more um, illness or, or discomfort than the disease itself? Yeah, I mean, I will admit that some people get COVID and have really mild, mild illness from it um, and, and many people who get the vaccine have a, a side effect from it. Like I said, 80 to 90% will have one, um, one of those symptoms. Um, I will say personally, I had quite a red sore arm and I, after my second dose, I had some nausea and you know just wasn't feeling great, but that lasted a day or two. And I feel like knowing that I am pr protected against being hospitalized or, or dying of COVID far outweighs any, you know, minor side effects of the vaccine. Um, so that, that would be what I would say about that. All right. That is, uh, and, and certainly if you've got other questions, throw them into the chat here or raise your hand. But at this stage, so right now what I see is uh, uh, there's a thanks in here. Someone says, thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for your research-based responses. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, see some, uh, some appreciation there. And at this stage, I think that's all the questions we have.
right at the moment. So, oh, we have a, let's see, another message in here. Yeah, another thank you. And so I think we're getting uh, generally, um, we'll give it just a minute of wait time in case there's anything we've missed. But uh, if not, I just wanna thank those who have signed on for joining us tonight for this. And Dr. Huang, thank you very much for uh, taking time to talk with us about the vaccine and answer questions and really appreciate uh, the discussion and opportunity to learn a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and um, being open to this talk. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, then I think we'll draw our uh, evening to a close and uh, hope everyone gets a chance to get out and enjoy the sunshine and the days uh, that it's going to stay, that it stays with us. And everyone cross your fingers for sunshine next week when we have our graduation events taking place. Oh, we have another question that has come in here. So do people have better immunity after they catch COVID naturally than with the vaccine? So that depends. That's a great question. Um, we know people who have severe COVID illness probably have um, pretty good immunity, um, but people who've had mild illness, uh, it's not necessarily known that they would produce a, a pretty robust antibody response if they were um, to see COVID again or one of the variants. So I would really say that getting the vaccine is the safest way of, of protection. Um, you're really playing Russian roulette if you're <laughs> debating if you're going to get the vaccine versus the virus. Um, and I know, I know it's really hard for people in the community who don't see, you know, who don't have loved ones who've died or, or see people who have had poor outcomes from COVID, but it is, it is real and um, our hospitals are, are being filled up and, and people millions of people are dying of this. And so it, it's something that I would say having the vaccine is just really such a, a gift um, to be able to be protected without the fear of actually getting the virus and possibly being severely affected or having long haul symptoms or dying of it. All right. All right. Well, I think that's our last question. And thank you once again. And everyone, have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.